Uh, like Casey said, my name is Israel Binium. I come from the University of Maryland at College Park, and my project concerns constraining dark matter and proton interactions in the early universe. Before I begin, I would like to thank George Driscoll, Rui Ann, Adam Hay, and Rochelle Verna for being my mentors, as well as my actual mentor, Vera Glucevic, and of course, the Simons Foundation, as well as the National Society of Black Physicists. Without all of those guys, none of this research is possible. Before I begin, I should provide some context, uh, one, of, one of which is discussing the cosmic microwave background. So what is that? CMB is an isotropic radiation that fills the whole universe dating back to 400,000 years after the Big Bang, um, uh, only observable at radio wavelengths, especially microwave. Now, what do I mean by isotropic? Isotropic means basically there are no preferred directions. Uh, no matter where you look, everything looks the same. The fluctuations are a little misleading. It's about, it's several micro Kelvin in comparison to the average 2.7 Kelvin. So really, for every hot spot, but still for every hot spot, there is a cold spot. Thus, the cosmological principle still stands. The universe is isotropic. The power spectrum tells us about the statistical variance of the fluctuations of the CMB on different scales, and it's used for describing the CMB often. I'll show an example later. Now, the other context is dark matter. Everyone's heard of that? Nobody knows what it is. Currently, we have detected it indirectly through methods such as gravitational lensing and analyzing rotational curves of galaxies where the velocity is higher at larger radius than expected. Um, but since it is not interacting with light, we cannot look at it. But what about the early universe? Like I said, the CMB is relic radiation. Its fluctuations tell us about the distant past. Now, that doesn't change much about the nature of dark matter. It's still, we still can't see it directly just by looking at the CMB. However, we can see the effect dark matter has on the CMB by observing it. What types of effects? Well, there are a couple, but this project, like I said earlier, focuses on dark matter baryon interactions. All particles in the standard model of physics are known to interact with each other. This motivates determining some dark matter interaction with some form of matter. Most uh, studies use protons and electrons. I use protons. The equation represents the interaction rate of two particles, which depends on their relative velocity. Some assumptions need to be made on the velocity dependence. Uh, studies must assume the power law and the velocity dependence to vary the other free parameters being the mass and the cross-section. For this project, I assume that n equals negative 4, which basically, uh, that n over there, uh, which basically is used to simulate uh, millicharge dark matter where there's a small fractional charge that has a chance to affect the scattering. Uh, so interactions suppress the power of the CMB output. I have this plot here to express that. Um, as the sigma naught decreases, that's the interaction strength, um, it kind of uh, agrees with the no interaction CMB output. So actually, let me explain the y-axis. Um, the CMB output, so I, I compute the ratio of the CMB output assuming interaction in comparison to CMB output assuming no interaction. As the interaction strength lowers, it agrees with the no interaction CMB, but as you increase it, it deviates more and more. Um, but what is the upper limit for which it deviates, but yet still agrees with current um, observations? That is the goal of my project. I would like to determine an upper limit. So what data did I use? Well, I used data from ACT. Um, I also used data from Planck. Planck is good for, I believe, large-scale observations, and ACT is good for small-scale observations. So combining the two gives you pretty much the full picture. Um, both data sets had the power spectra computed already, and I obtained the likelihoods to the data from GitHub. I didn't have to do any of that, which was great. Yeah. Um, so what codes did I use to analyze the data? Well, there's class, uh, the Cosmic Linear and Isotropy System Solver. 
uh, I used this software to make the two previous plots. Um, and it's very useful for computing theories, theory curves for data analysis, assuming different parameters. Um, yeah, that's what it was useful for. Now, the really useful code was Kobaya. Simply put, it uses class to compute theories and compare them to actual data from act or plank. It does it as much as I want. Um, the more detailed explanation concerns Bayes' theorem, which basically relates the hard quantity to get, which is the probability that the theory matches the data, to the easier quantity to get, which is the probability that the data matches our theory. So Kabaya accepts parameter settings with class, and, and basically it computes the same uh, process thousands of times until it finds the parameters that best maximize the posterior probability, which is the left side of that equation. Um, whichever parameters you choose to evaluate theories with, whether you define them yourself or if it was built into class, um, it plots the probability distributions as I have all the way to the far right. So what we have at the far right is basically what we like to call a triangle plot which basically is an assortment of parameters that are plotted against each other, and the result is a two, essentially a two-dimensional distribution uh, of probabilities, um, where the center, well, in this case, they're Gaussian, so the center of the shapes is essentially has the best fit coordinate. And when it accidentally plots against itself, it ends up doing the one-dimensional case. Um, now, like I said earlier, I wish to get an upper limit. So what I'm looking for is the right end of the Gaussian. So, um, I had everything I needed. I knew what I wanted to do. So uh, how hard could it be? Well, the simple answer to that question is everything. Uh, I, yeah, um, I spent a month learning the basics of cosmology and I spent the next month learning the basics of HPC computing. Um, yeah, this was, uh, this was fun. <laughs> yeah. So uh, after a month of that, literally yesterday morning, um, I get the results, which is the 95% contour, like I said, that I, was, that I was looking for earlier, the right end of the Gaussian, essentially. Um, so let's talk about this plot. Um, so the title, I'll say it. Um, is the 95% confidence upper contour on dark matter cross-section and mass degeneracy assuming velocity dependence power law n equals negative four. So that's a lot for a title. Um, you know, it's just one line. Uh, so, uh, so basically I'll go over again what I was trying to find. Um, I'm looking for the upper bound on the cross-section. That tail end begins at around the 95% confidence interval. So I plotted that contour alone using the resulting chains from Kobaya. Put simply, everything above that line is out of the question for cross-section, and everything below the line is fair game. Well, no, technically not fair game because it's different probabilities. But uh, essentially, I found the upper limit. Yeah. Um, so just another summary. Um, uh, my goal was to find the upper limit of the cross-section strength given the data that I had access to. Using Kobaya, I had class make theoretical predictions thousands of times until the theory best matched the data. While not conclusive, the results showed a limit to which we can guess how dark matter interacts with protons assuming our assumption. And that's pretty much it. All right. Uh, I, I want to start. First of all, uh, you know, you spent eight, nine, ten weeks just finding an upper limit, and it seems like a lot. I, I spent six years in graduate school doing the same thing, so <laughs> <laughs> it get it can get worse. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, any any questions for Israel? So. I was wondering, you picked this one particular model uh, where you have v to the minus four. I wonder if. Uh, you know, could you just remind me why it was that model and why not uh, n equals minus three or m minus five? Um, I'll be honest with you, I don't have a particular reason myself. Um, my, uh, my mentor told me that it assumes millet, like there's a fractional charge within the dark matter particle, and I was like, okay, that's cool. Okay, cool. Um, 
And uh, I read a lot of papers that did the same thing. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's as good a reason as any if that's what uh, people are doing. I know that's not a satisfying answer, so I guess maybe I'll go into a little more detail about the N. Uh, essentially, our, our, to our knowledge, uh, the universe was initially hot and dense, and then it got cooler as it expanded. So what you're doing with the Ns is you're kind of predicting the, how the cross-section evolves with time. So, what you're, so if we choose a positive V dependence on the power law, um, we're assuming that more interactions happened earlier on. Whereas with negative integers, uh, you assume that more cross that there is more chance of dark matter interacting with protons later on. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's kind of another basic idea. Cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, Natalie. Um, I have a very basic question. While you're on the slide, can you tell me what these x and y axes are again? Sorry. Yes. Um, the y axis is the uh, the interaction strength, which was the sigma naught that I was varying in the other plot earlier. And the x-axis is basically log 10 of the mass. So you have uh, basically the 6, the 7, the 8, the 9. So that's like each of those is kind of like an exponential. It's like, so like if you just, if I just did mass, uh, it would have been like, you know, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9, um, that type of mass, like scale. Is that the mass of the dark matter particle? Dark matter particle, yes. Okay. For each uh, dark matter particle mass, there is an upper limit on the cross-section. That's what that degenerates is. Great. Okay. Um, let's thank Israel one more time.